Mm. I thought I'd start with a song. A long, long time ago. You can all feel free to join in if you like. A long, long time ago, I shall all remember how that music used to make me smile. And I knew if I had my chance that I could make those people dance and maybe they'd be happy for a while. But February made me shiver with every paper I deliver. Bad news on the doorstep. I couldn't take one more step. I can't remember if I cried when I read about his widowed bride. But something touched me deep inside the day the music died. You probably know the rest. Bye bye, Miss American Pie, etc., etc. Do you know, however, what was the day the music died? What was it referring to? There are a lot of theories. It would make sense if it were the day JFK was killed. Hmm? I see you got right to the right answer. You're supposed to start with the wrong answer. No, no, you're right. See, most people initially think when they hear the song, because it's kind of a 60s song, that it's about the death of JFK, you know, and his widow cried and all of that, the day the music died. Except, of course, if you listen to the lyrics, it's February. It's not November, which is when Kennedy was assassinated. It was actually 1958, and it was actually when, uh, famously, you know, Richie Valens and Buddy Holly, they flipped a coin, supposedly. They were both going to go to a concert. But there was only room for one more person on the plane. Or I guess, no, there, were, there was room for two on the plane. One person had to be out in the cold, you know, in like a, a van, basically, an unheated van, while the other could take the plane and then sleep in a warm hotel room. So everyone wanted to take the plane. Buddy Holly won which meant he got on the plane, and of course the plane crashed, and he died. So anyway, that's the real day the music died. But it's interesting that the song caught on. It was actually, um, the song was actually originally produced by Don McLean in 1972. So the song, like a lot of stuff, like the, there was a show called Happy Days. It was the same thing. It was like it was set in the 70s, but it's harking back to the 1950s. It's about nostalgia in a way. The notion, I suppose you might call it almost like a lost innocence. Um, yes, Americans, particularly of the left, like to look at the 1950s as a reactionary time, you know, of patriarchy where, you know, women were all in the kitchen, you know, cooking and this and that. And there's some truth to that. It is true that, oddly, I think the thing that distinguished the 1950s culturally, what people remember from the television programs and the sitcoms, was that there was a kind of new thing. It was actually, people thought it had been forever. It was actually new. Housewives. And the reason there were so many housewives in the 1950s was actually pretty simple. You know, there was a couple of things. One, a lot of women had gone to work in the factories in the Second World War. Then the men came back, and they didn't want to work in the factories. The other thing, though, was the 1950s was a time of the most kind of egalitarian distribution of income, um, partly because of high taxation. And so you really didn't have such a great gap between the rich and the poor. It was also the time of the greatest racial homogeneity in American history, because in the 1920s they cut off immigration. So you'd had this like vast kind of acculturation of the new immigrants. No, no one else was coming. America probably settled into its, you might say, like its, its most stable equilibrium culturally of all time, which was, of course, not to last. And the reason that the equality of income mattered was because Basically, it meant now that, you know, it used to be like if you were a woman and you went to college and then you got married, well, you didn't have to work in the kitchen because you had servants. Now, it was kind of like people were well off enough so that both didn't have to work, but on the other hand, they weren't rich enough to have servants. So it was a strange time that everyone in retrospect thought it was like the way things had always been, whereas in fact, it was really only the way they were for like a particular moment. But the reason, of course, it resonates so much in the popular consciousness is because of what happened in, you know, quote unquote, the 60s. You know, when people talk about the counterculture and the hippies and the war protests, the street violence, the race riots. It was as if this country that had, you know, presented this image to the world of this kind of paradise after the Second World War was convulsed by a virtual civil war of a cultural nature. Now, it's true a lot of this was exaggerated. In fact, as late as, let's say, 1968, 1969, although there were hippies and there were protests, the Vietnam War, believe it or not, was actually still popular. 
I mean, I can tell you this literally because we have the evidence. Richard Nixon was elected in 1968 and re-elected by a landslide in 1972. You know, that was the famous so-called silent majority. That is, the people who weren't out in the streets protesting. Just the people, the kind of the ordinary folk, you know, who just supported their country in time of war because they thought that was what you did. They didn't give a lot of thought to it. That said, the war did tear a huge hole in America's social fabric which is significant not just for American history, but of course eventually for the world, because America was the world's greatest power at the time. So that the collapse and decline of not only America's strategic power, but to a certain extent its cultural confidence, the, the glue that had held it together as a nation, had I think immense repercussions and consequences. Also, all of these protests, I mean, some of them were confined to America, but some of them, of course, were global. I mean, 1968 was literally a year of student revolutions around the world. The French like to say that they started it. Yeah, the Sorbonne and basically Nanterre and Paris, there were huge student protests. And eventually they did sweep through most of the Western world. Maybe it was something in the air, but I actually have a much simpler theory. It was about demographics. It was about, in some ways, the key demographic fact, at least of the 20th century in the West, which was the post-war baby boom. After 1945, that is, people you know, came home from the Second World War, and while well, the men had been out there for a long time without their wives, <laughs> and anyway, you know, push came to shove and it wasn't really that complicated. Uh, many of them hadn't even seen their wives in five years. And so you can imagine, you know, it was, uh, well, shall we say, yeah, happy reunion. Um, and yes, many children were born. Uh, among them, my parents. My parents, were, they were actually a little bit early. My mother was born on May 9th, which was actually the day after they surrendered in Europe. <laughs> My father was born just a couple weeks previous to that, in April 1945. So they were like the early wave. Um, you should really remember this stuff, because it's not just important for you know, Vietnam, as I'm going to talk about today, but when people are talking about the fiscal crisis, the fall of the dollar that everyone is talking about, one of the big reasons is, of course, simple mathematics. Social Security benefits and Medicare are supposed to kick in when people turn 65, right? You can take them a little bit early if you want, then you take a little less, or you can wait a little longer, and then you take a little more. But most people, the vast majority, take them at 65. Okay, well, right now, we've just gone from 2010 to 2011. 2010, 11 minus 65 is 1945, 1946 the onset of the baby boom, which means you now have, I mean, basically, the baby boom, like, if, if you were to actually chart it, you know, it looks kind of like this. You have, like, the birth rate, you know, it's a little bit like this, and then suddenly it goes, Woo! <laughs> This is why there was such a cultural explosion in the 1960s. Basically, you just had an immense mass of teenagers, and then people in their early 20s. And some of it had to do with accidents like, you know, the spread of contraception, and that was significant. The spread of, you know, shall we say drugs like marijuana, that was also significant. But the real factor was just this massive growth of people, and frankly, it was also because of the prosperity. You know, you had a bunch of people who were 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. Some of them had to go fight in the war, yes, but not all of them did. And that was also significant. That was one of the reasons it became so controversial. If you look at the baby boom, another way of looking at it is like this. The, the three sort of key years, in a way, of the escalation of the war from about 1965 to 1968. Well, let's do some more basic math. Baby boom starts in 1945. Okay, so you've got now a massive influx of young men of arms bearing age, beginning around 1964, 1965. In fact, in just three years, someone did a count, and they said the people who came of draft age, that is, turned 18, 27 million in three years. Do you imagine how expensive it would be, even if you weren't at war, you know, just to feed and clothe and house 27 million soldiers? Yeah, it's a good problem to have if you're the military, but it's also a complicated one, because legally, there's a draft. There had been, well, there was a draft in the Second World War, then for two years after when America was disengaging, there wasn't. Then at the time of the Truman Doctrine, aid to Greece and Turkey, they reinstated the draft. 
So you have a draft by law, which is supposed to be equal to everyone. You know how it works in Turkey. I mean, that's, I think, one thing that actually works really well in Turkey. A country like Russia today has a draft, but you can buy your way out of it really easily. It's true in Turkey you can sort of like buy your way into uh, shorter service. Like if you've lived abroad or something, I think, you can do it in a month. You know, some people do it in six months, some people do it in 12. There, there are different gradations, but the theory is it's supposed to hit everyone equally, right? Because otherwise it's unfair. It's unfair if the rich, have to, or the rich don't have to serve and the poor have to serve. In Russia today, it's grossly unfair. I mean, anyone with money can buy their way out. So that the people who are left are the poor, basically, the runt of the litter. Well, they didn't want to be so blunt as to say, well, OK, we'll have the poor serve. In, in retrospect, everyone said, oh, well, they had the blacks serve. You know, that wasn't really technically true. In fact, proportionately far more poor whites served than poor blacks. This is also partly because a lot of whites actually volunteered. It's an Appalachian South, it basically it's an Irish thing. <laughs> a lot of whites actually always volunteer for the army. But that said, it did disproportionately hit the poor. The main dividing line they came up with was, of course, the university deferment, as it was called. Um, so this creates all kinds of psychological, political complications. On the one hand, it's the, the inequity of it, the unfairness of it, that some people fight and other people, you know, Bill Clinton famously even sent a letter to his draft officer, you know, saying, I oppose the war. It's a little bit like I, I smoked marijuana, but I didn't inhale. You know, I oppose the war, but I want to maintain my political viability. He actually said that. <laughs> and so he wanted to make himself eligible. He, he actually tried to voluntarily remove his own deferment. And they wrote back and they basically said, that's OK. We don't want you. You don't have to serve. <laughs> so he didn't actually serve. There was controversy about Bush versus Kerry, you remember, a few years ago. Actually, you were pretty young even in 2004, weren't you? But you know, Bush served, but yes, it was in the National Guard. So he, he didn't actually go to Vietnam, whereas Kerry did. And so that was like an argument in Kerry's favor, at least you know, among the people who care about that sort of thing. And so it became a big question, you know, did you serve or not? Uh, in fact, a very small percentage of that 27 million people were sent to Vietnam. The other thing they did, though, which was kind of interesting, because they had too many people, they cycled them in and out of Vietnam very quickly. And so instead of there being this atmosphere of like an army that actually had esprit de corps and purpose, it was more like you just, you were there for 12 months, so you kind of waited out your time. And then meanwhile, a new batch of people came in who had been like hanging out in America in the 60s. And so eventually, of course, that culture infected the army. You know, so that by the early 1970s, I mean, it was extraordinary. I mean, you had people in the US Army who were supposedly in charge of nuclear weapons. They weren't crackheads, because crack hadn't come yet. But I mean, you know, there, were, there were people who were like addicted to heroin, who were in charge of very expensive weapons. It was a total meltdown, I mean, of a kind almost unprecedented in history. It didn't completely sap the fighting power of the military, but it definitely sapped morale. And you know, some of it was because of the unfairness of the draft. Some of it was because of the fact that the war, to a lot of the people, didn't seem like it had much point. And some of it was also due to the strategic confusion of the generals. I mean, in the end, you have to fault the politicians and the generals who made the decisions. It's not that the war couldn't have been won in some way or other. But the way they chose to fight it was simply bizarre. OK, so how did it begin? We talked about the French involvement you know, back in the late 40s and early 50s. That, that stretch of the war, if you remember, mostly ended in 1954 at Dien Bien Phu uh, with you know, resounding defeat by the French forces. They came to the peace table, ceasefire. It was partitioned. They were supposed to hold elections, but the Americans didn't insist. And then they ended up kind of scotching the elections because, of course, they knew that Ho Chi Minh would win. Ho Chi Minh because he was the guerrilla leader, communist, but who had you know, led the resistance to the French so that even in the South they figured where you know, the French were more popular, they figured he would still be more popular than any other politician. So they didn't hold elections. Um, the North created this force, the Viet Cong, you know, that infiltrated the South and it was kind of like a low-scale guerrilla war for the late 50s, early 60s. At times it would get worse, you know, there would be bombings here or there, a village would be taken, a village would be burned down. It was in the news, it was kind of like a civil war. The Americans had a few advisors on the ground but no soldiers. You know, this is when Americans like to debate about 
escalation and should they have stayed out and had JFK lived, what we, would he have done? All very interesting questions. The evidence seems to suggest that JFK would not have stayed out. I talked about the anti-gem coup, that was Zhou Jin Jem. You know, who was not only ousted from power, but was literally assassinated in 1963, within several weeks of JFK's own death. The reason we know that JFK was involved and green-lighted this coup was because of the Pentagon Papers, eerily similar to WikiLeaks from 1971. So we know a lot of the details. Okay, so Jem was felled. It's probably a mistake because even though he was corrupt and so on and wasn't very popular, there weren't really any good candidates to replace him. So anyway, things kept getting worse. You know, the government in the South was corrupt. It wasn't popular. The police treated people brutally. Morale was bad. That said, it's not like the South wanted to be taken over by the North. I mean, they were communists and they came down and they burned down people's villages. It was a very ugly war. So the Americans had some reasons for thinking they should stand by this government. Kind of like they had gotten there in the first place because of the French. Now they were just staying on because they were there in a way, because they felt responsible. But that said, they didn't have to send the troops. The thing which led to that was the so-called Gulf of Tonkin incident. You know, and this is in the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of Vietnam, a couple of fishing trawlers supposedly. Uh, it was, at the time even, it was controversial. Uh, the North Vietnamese definitely actually launched some rockets at the American ships. As it turned out, and we know from the Pentagon Papers, they actually had been justified in the sense that the Americans had been firing on them, that it was actually like a two-way engagement. At the time they covered this up, Congress passed the so-called Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Again, a strange aspect of constitutional history is that since the Second World War, America has not actually declared war. They just pass these resolutions authorizing the use of force. It's like very wishy-washy. But anyway, they pass a resolution authorizing the use of force, and that's when LBJ steps in, in part because he's running for election in 1964. Um, the incident happened in the height of an election campaign. You know, he's up against a Republican who's kind of criticizing the Democrats for being you know, soft on communism, the usual argument. So the usual thing he wants to show that he's tough. Um, I think I mentioned the famous chicken shit quote, you know, explaining, oh, well, if, you know, if we lose Vietnam after this, 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 it'll be even worse than losing China. There will be this, you know, huge reaction in American politics. He was a very complicated man, uh, Johnson. I mean, in some ways very heroic, in other ways borderline criminal. I mean, he was very interesting. Uh, he had a lot of complexes. But anyway, so for these various reasons, psychological reasons, political reasons, he authorized the first serious ex escalation of troops. First it was a couple tens of thousands, then we're talking about hundreds of thousands. You know, by the height, like 1966-67, there were more than 600,000 American troops in Vietnam. So what were, they <laughs> what were they supposed to be doing? Well, here's where it got a little tricky. You send an army of 650,000, you know, against a third world country, admittedly one that has a pretty serious army in the north, and a serious guerrilla force, the Viet Cong, kind of paramilitary force. Well, it would suggest you're trying to, at the very least, defeat them, you would think. <laughs> that is, to defeat North Vietnam, possibly invade North Vietnam, and overthrow Ho Chi Minh and the communists. But that was never an objective. This is one of the things about all of these postmodern wars. They're having the same problem in Libya right now, right? What is our objective? I still don't know. Is it to overthrow Gaddafi? Sometimes they say it is, sometimes they say it isn't. In Vietnam, they were actually pretty clear that they had no intention of overthrowing the North Vietnamese government. And they never did invade the North. In fact, not only did they not invade the North, but they had all kinds of specific rules of engagement which made it impossible even for the pilots to do very much damage even when they were bombing the North. These rules of engagement, the thing that made them so difficult, well, I'll give you an idea. I've, I have a friend actually, his name is Ken Rust. Uh, he's a retired pilot. You know, he used to pilot, uh, I think it was like a, you know, American Airlines jets. And of course, before then, uh, he was a pilot in Vietnam. And here's what they had to do. Okay, so you know, they're somewhere off the coast of North Vietnam. They're on these aircraft carriers, which were even more dangerous then than they are now. I mean, you might have seen like the movie Top Gun, like you know how they have to 
you know, you land and like you practically have to hit the grappling hook or else you're going to go off the other side, like at virtual supersonic speeds. Incredibly dangerous. You know, accidents happen all the time. So you have to do a dangerous takeoff and a dangerous landing. Now in between, you know, you go over the harbor in Hanoi in North Vietnam, right? Now in that harbor, there are all kinds of weapons being offloaded from the Soviet Union and China, who are, of course, supporting North Vietnam. But you're not allowed to fire at those weapons because that might lead the Soviet Union or China to retaliate. And meanwhile, if there are anti-aircraft batteries that are firing on you in the harbor, you're not supposed to fire at them either because that might provoke an international incident. Now, I mean, you have to remember, of course, in the backdrop of all of this is the nuclear factor, right? Yes, no one wants a war between America and the Soviet Union. No one wants a direct exchange of hostile fire between American and Soviet troops. It could escalate into nuclear war. But because of that, this meant that American pilots could fire at virtually no legitimate targets. They would have a tiny list of things they could actually attack. Um, this happens a lot in these modern wars. Like in, in uh, the Kosovo War, 1999, there was a famous incident where the U.S. bombed the Chinese embassy by mistake. But the thing that was more interesting than the mistake was the fact that they had all these incredibly precise targets. Now, laser-guided weapons being more accurate, you know, they could say, I'm going to hit that building, or, but not this building. I mean, literally, they were aiming for the building on the other side of the street, and they hit the Chinese embassy by mistake. Now, weapons were not as accurate in the 1960s, but even so, with these not terribly accurate you know, bombs and missiles, they were supposed to hit this, but not that. A lot of these pilots, of course, died from the anti-aircraft fire, you know, other kinds of accidents. It was incredibly dangerous, and then on top of that, every so often they would just stop doing it. They had no less than 16 outright bombing pauses, the idea always being, let's leave a door open for negotiations. There were no less than 72 peace initiatives that came from Washington. They were constantly talking, constantly trying to end the war by negotiation. Even while, yes, the CIA was doing various covert black ops that were not terribly savory and trying to you know, infiltrate the North by other means. And then the troops, of course, were not supposed to invade the North. They were just supposed to kind of stay in the South in case the North invaded and for the most part, just fight the Viet Cong from time to time. That is to fight these kind of partisan guerrillas, you know, who would come out of nowhere and then go back into nowhere, and then they would end up, you know, hiding in these tunnels and so on. Um, some of the controversies about the war dealt with things like napalm. You know, napalm was this kind of orange, uh, Agent Orange substance that they would drop. And the reason they would drop it, of course, was to basically kill the vegetation so that they could see where their enemy was, because they had no idea where their enemy was. It's like you're over there fighting this war, you're not sure against whom, you're not sure where the enemy is or even if the enemy is there. You don't really have any intelligence from the air because of the thick vegetation. I mean, there are all kinds of like tactical and strategical problems. Curiously, the only time when the war actually went well for the Americans was during the Tet Offensive of 1968. The Tet Offensive is when the North Vietnamese abandoned their successful strategy of guerrilla war and actually tried an outright invasion, you know, like attacking U.S. bases, attacking major cities. It was a serious offensive, almost like a World War II style offensive. Yeah. Is that what led to Operation Rolling Thunder? Uh, Rolling Thunder. I think so, but... Rolling Thunder, uh, I'm going to have to look that up because Rolling Thunder was that, I'm not sure if it was in response to the Tet Offensive or whether that was something they talked about later. I'll look that up. That's a good question. I don't remember exactly when they initiated Rolling Thunder. This was more of a defensive campaign, though, for the Americans, but it was a successful one. Yes, they lost a lot of troops, they lost a lot of lives and so on, and a few bases they even lost temporarily to the North Vietnamese. But essentially, the North Vietnamese, it wasn't that their fighting capacity was wiped out. But, you know, they lost five to ten times as many soldiers, you know, per capita as the Americans did. It was a crushing victory for the Americans. But that's not how it was portrayed in the media. For the obvious reason that a lot of people had died. And, you know, Americans in these modern wars tend to think there won't be that many casualties. And so, yes, the body bags were coming home. And oddly enough, again, another one of these curious things about the Vietnam War, they tried to learn this lesson later, is that they did not control the media very well. You know, they literally had, there's this movie, uh, another good movie reference, Mel Gibson did this movie a few years ago called uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. 
And there's a scene at the end of the movie. You've just watched the movie, so you've witnessed this battle, this horrendous war of attrition you know, over a hill, basically, between the Americans and the Vietnamese. The Americans end up winning by the skin of their teeth. You know, when the helicopter gunships arrive just as they're about to be wiped out, you know, Mel Gibson has lost like most of his friends and, and sort of comrades in arms. He's just barely survived. He's like dripping blood. And this reporter comes up to him. <laughs> He's like, hey, so what do you think? Do you think you underestimated the enemy? And, you know, he, just, he doesn't know what to say. <laughs> the thing is, like, why was the reporter there to begin with? Uh, I mean, it was definitely a mistake from the communications and PR standpoint for the Army not to control the media. Incidentally, talking about politicians, Al Gore, who I'm sure you've heard of, former vice president, he was in Vietnam, but he was there actually as a reporter, but through some kind of military commission. Now, everyone had some connection to it. Um, but so anyway, so the Tet Offensive, gross failure lost by the North Vietnamese, but in the American media, it completely discredits the war. You know, and maybe legitimately, because even though the Americans won the battle, of course, they didn't gain anything. So in that sense, the media did kind of have a point. It was getting to be really bloody. And in fact, the way the war was even being described back in Washington by people like McNamara, the Secretary of Defense. Where did I write McNamara's name? Yeah, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense. Because they had no other way of measuring success, they would literally talk about the body count. You know, they would say, this is how many people we killed. I'm not saying this is what they would say to the media. I'm saying, like, this is what they would say to the president. And then they would spin it up into some press release and say, well, we've made progress because we killed a lot of the enemy. So? I mean, you made progress because you killed a lot of the enemy? There are a lot more of them. And meanwhile, what have you gained? You know, very little. So the absence of any actual strategy, that is the absence of any plan to either overthrow the North or of any measurable, quantifiable objective, just eventually discredited the war even in the eyes of a lot of the leading military brass. Now, oddly enough, the public, even despite the media campaign after the Tet Offensive, still more or less supported the war. We know this because Nixon won in 1968, and he won even more overwhelmingly in 1972 both times against more or less anti-war candidates. So the public didn't want to lose the war. But on the other hand, I don't think anyone really had an idea as to how to win the war. So that eventually, it wasn't just that there was the unfairness of the draft and you know, the protests and so on, and yeah, the hippies and free love and all of this other stuff. It was also that the government itself was becoming discredited, a little bit like what happened, I think, in the First World War. You know, all of the ruling establishments that had sent the men into the trenches to no apparent end, uh, you know, particularly in Germany, Austria-Hungary, Russia, even to some extent Turkey, where you can say, you know, the Ottoman rulers were discredited. Although I guess there it was more by the peace than the war in the Ottoman case. The American government was really just losing its own credibility. Um, some of it, again, was because of its inability to control the media. But then, of course, there were the Pentagon Papers. I mean, this, in some ways, was probably more important than the actual events on the ground. It was, I mean, it was WikiLeaks, basically, before WikiLeaks, except instead of some, you know, rogue sex predator, whatever this guy, you know, he's on trial in Sweden for, uh, what is his name? Julian Assange or something? Yeah, he's on trial for rape in Sweden or something. That's how they actually arrested him, I think. But yeah, instead of some rogue, I guess he's Australian, I think, by nationality. Oh, he's from New Zealand, is he? It was actually an American defense consultant who worked for the Pentagon who actually leaked all of the documents, you know, about the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, about inner kind of workings of the government, about the total lack of any strategy coordination, about the appalling, you know, kind of emphasis on body counts and all of the rest of the horrible story of like how badly the war was being run, the draft and its inequities. 47 volumes of documents were released Actually, in some ways, again, similar. It was like drip by drip. They released them a little bit at a time, mostly to the uh, Washington Post and to the New York Times. Um, so anyway, so the WikiLeaks of its time, the Pentagon Papers, the man's name was Daniel Ellsberg, the one who leaked the documents. Um, this led not only to the you know, gross discrediting of sort of the government and its cause in the eyes of many Americans, but it was also a security breach that was fairly significant. I mean, ever since then, you know, elements of the different branches of the U.S. government have never been entirely sure that whatever it is that they say will remain secret. 
uh, even before WikiLeaks, because there might always be other members of this branch who had some agenda who would then leak it to the media. Now, that's not surprising. I mean, there are always people who seek to gain. The difference now was that the newspapers were actually publishing it. In an earlier era, they wouldn't have, because they would have seen it as their duty not to. This was true not just of military secrets, but by the late 1970s, it had gotten to the point where it was almost like a sport among uh, a lot of newspapers in Europe and America to publish the names of CIA agents who were working undercover abroad. It was mostly not American newspapers that did this. It was mostly like, you know, the communist press in Europe, like Italy and France and whatnot. But interestingly, they once did like a, a poll to see how many editors, that is, of the American media would publish this information if it came to them. And it was about half and half. About half said they wouldn't, half said they would. Even if it meant they knew that this agent was going to get killed because his identity had been revealed. The corrosion, you can see in Hollywood too. I mean, the movies from this era, I mean, they're amazing. Like Day of the Condor with Robert Redford. Uh, even the Manchurian Candidate made a little while ago. You know, it used to be that the movies would be about, you know, some enemy that was presumably like foreign or communist or Nazi or something. And you still see that every so often. Now it's like the enemy's inside the U.S. government, right? <laughs> it's always like the U.S. government that's trying to kill its own citizens. That's how corrosive the cynicism was. But there was a more direct result of the publication of the Pentagon Papers. Nixon, now again, like Johnson, they were both complicated men with lots of, you know, complexes. In Nixon's case, now his own complex, it was partly about the media itself, because he knew the media didn't like him. Uh, in part because he had a whole thing about JFK. You know, JFK came from the Northeast, he came from Boston, he was a Brahmin, you know, he was rich, he went to Harvard. Nixon came from California, you know, from a small town. He wasn't sophisticated. He didn't speak with the right accent. So he thought they kind of had it in for him, the East Coast media. There may have even been an element of anti-Semitism. We know that he kind of, you know, he traded jokes about Jews inside the White House. We know this because eventually we have all the transcripts of like what they talked about. And yes, a lot of the leading editors and so on of the newspapers were Jewish, so there might have been an element of that too. But anyway, there was like serious tension, almost hatred between them. There was actually a scene after Nixon had lost to JFK in 1960. You know, he then ran for, was it governor or senator? I don't remember, but California, 1962. And he lost. He actually lost again, like in a, in a smaller election. And he went out to meet the press. <laughs> and he actually said, I kid you not, he, he looked at the members of the media and he said, well... I guess you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. I <laughs> mean, he just like stormed off the stage. He had this complex about JFK that was just fascinating. You know, he thought JFK skated through life, he got everything easy. Nixon had no favorable coverage from the media, and now the media was ganging up on him. That's how he saw it, right? Nixon, at least in the policy sense, was doing some, you know, some sensible things regarding Vietnam. He called his policy Vietnamization, you know, meaning, again, let the Vietnamese fight. Turn the war over to the South Vietnamese, train them, let them fight their own war. And it did have some results, I mean, quite literally. The U.S., when Nixon was elected in 1968, had 550,000 troops on the ground. By the time of his re-election in 1972, only 24,000. This was not the least reason that he was popular. Expenditure on the war also dropped from $25 billion annually to $3 billion. So the policy, at least in the kind of you know, financial and sort of numerical metrics, looked successful. And in fact, to some extent, you could even say that on the battlefield. Again, it's not that they were invading the North, they weren't. But the US no longer had troops there. In April 1972, the North Vietnamese attacked again. You know, an even larger scale than in the Tet Offensive. Everyone's forgotten about this because it's one of those battles that, again, didn't seem to prefigure the end of the war. They fought, that is, mostly against the South Vietnamese, supposedly a paper tiger. There are only 24,000 Americans left. They lost. The South actually won. Yes, they had help from American air power, you know, which it turned out was actually pretty effective when it came to just, when you had like an army in open battle and you had tanks that you could see from the air. They actually did knock out most of the tanks and the air power was sufficient. So the idea was, let the South Vietnamese do the ground fighting, we will give them air support. This campaign in 1972 was so successful for the South that the North Vietnamese actually came to the negotiating table at Paris in early 1973. 
and they accepted a ceasefire. Now, they may not have been intending to keep it forever, but for the time being, it looked like the war was over. The South had expelled the North. The Viet Cong, incidentally, had been completely destroyed in the Tet Offensive, so they weren't really a factor anymore. The Americans, with air power, seemed to suggest that they were going to stick around at least to support the South Vietnamese. That was, again, 1972, and then the Accords were in January 1973. Almost simultaneously, the Watergate scandal broke. Now, Watergate was about a lot of things. There was a break-in, obviously, at the Watergate Hotel, uh, more recently known as uh, home of Monica Lewinsky when she was having the affair with Bill Clinton in the 1990s. The Watergate, there are a lot of stories about the Watergate. It's like an apartment complex in Washington. But anyway, so yes, they broke into Democratic Party headquarters, you know, a couple of sort of thugs hired by people hired by eventually the Nixon administration. There's no mystery about this. You know, we know the basic facts of it. Um, the thing about the story, though, I mean, like what, the, what the, the Nixon defenders like to say is, well, sure, it was you know, illegal and we don't deny that, but this kind of thing happened all the time. And in fact, it did. LBJ did that to his opponents. JFK did that sort of thing to his opponents. It wasn't necessarily new. What was new, though, was this pervasive attitude now where government was sort of suspect and discredited in people's eyes, where the newspapers had taken this active role you know, partly oppositional to Nixon, partly oppositional just to anyone in government. It turned into, of course, a scandal, made the reputation of Woodward and Bernstein, these famous reporters on the Washington Post. And eventually, you know, Nixon's own behavior led it to snowball because, you know, there was an investigation and then a cover-up, as they call it, you know, denying that they knew what they knew when they knew it, etc., etc., etc. It was one of those things where the break-in mattered less than the reaction to it afterwards or by about the spring of 1973, Nixon is in full-time damage control. That is, Congress is investigating. It's sort of also the Democrats' revenge for the McCarthy period, because in the McCarthy period of the 50s, the Republicans controlled Congress, and they had their sort of witch hunts against the Democrats. It was sort of like the Democrats' revenge. They're investigating everybody. In fact, one of the odder aspects of the scandal, I talked about how Ford eventually took over as president who wasn't even vice president. You know, he came from like the third spot, the Speaker of the House, because the vice president, Spiro Agnew, himself was arrested on unrelated charges of corruption and embezzlement. Everyone in the government is getting investigated. You know, Nixon ultimately resigns in part so that he won't actually have to face criminal charges. It's important for a lot of reasons. You know, first of all, because for about, again, two years, a little bit like with Wilson in 1919, 1920, America effectively had no president. That is, no effective president, no president with any authority or legitimacy. Among other things, this coincided with the Arab-Israeli War of 73, Yom Kippur War, coincided, of course, with the Arab oil embargo and the oil shock, which led to you know, massive stagflation in the world economy. And of course, not least, it had an impact on Vietnam. Quite specifically, the eclipse of the president's authority meant, a little bit like balance here, the president goes down, Congress goes up. So Congress didn't just put through, um, they put through something called the War Powers Act, which meant that the president, in the end it didn't have as much effect as they wanted. The, it was supposed to limit the president's authority to deploy troops abroad. More significant than that were the funding decisions. Um, America, remember, was supposed to support the South Vietnamese with air support. Also, I didn't mention this, but it kind of goes without saying, money, of course. They have to use money to pay their troops, to buy supplies. Most of their weapons, of course, come from America. They have to pay for them. They have to pay for components, all the rest of it. OK, so what happens to the money? Well, Congress quite literally decides to stop giving it. In fact, in 1973, Senator Edward Kennedy, this is Ted Kennedy, who was the brother of JFK, who was elected to the Senate at age 30 with a resume which included going to Harvard and getting expelled for cheating. Anyway, this is Edward Kennedy. He mobilizes a Senate vote. The issue is, will we give money to South Vietnam that had already been appropriated in 1972 but not spent? You know, that is, the money is actually already there. We promised them money, but we didn't give them all of it. It's just like sitting there in a bank account. And he got the Congress to vote no. In June of 1973, Senator Frank Church, uh, Frank Church, he actually comes from Idaho, which is, you don't have to remember his name, but it's, it's one of those little tidbits that's good to know. He came from Idaho, the state I was actually born in, oddly enough. 
at about the same time, 1974. Frank Church, became, he became this crusader against you know, executive corruption and so on. He eventually gutted the CIA. I mean, literally, the CIA was gutted of virtually every agent who knew what they were doing. What they did is they made sure that anyone who had any association with people with, you know, kind of questionable human rights records and backgrounds, in other words, exactly the kind of people the CIA usually pumped for information, would be fired. So essentially, they gutted the entire CIA in 1970. Before that, he put through a resolution forbidding the U.S to use air power in Indochina, whether in Vietnam or in Cambodia. No airplanes, not allowed. This was June 1973. Okay, well by the end of that year, things are getting desperate. The North Vietnamese are gearing up for another attack, now realizing that the South is running out of supplies, no longer has air support. Oh, and meanwhile, the Arab oil embargo says the price of oil skyrocketing, and now they don't have any money to buy oil with, and so they have all these planes and tanks that are just kind of sitting there idling because they have no fuel for them. Okay, so Ford, Ford, the new president who wasn't even elected, who has no effective authority, Ford goes before Congress and he says, look, this war, we understand it's not popular, but we're no longer fighting it, we're just trying to support the Vietnamese who are fighting it themselves. They're out of money, they're running out of supplies. Desperately, please, can we give them $300 million? Not billion, million dollars. Um, he also asked for an extra $222 million for Cambodia. You may remember Cambodia from the other day. That is to defend the Cambodian regime, well, basically Cambodian civilization, from the homicidal lunatics of the Khmer Rouge. And Congress said no. In fact, quite expressly, <laughs> they were even asked, um, will the United States, this is Ford speaking, which has so far consistently stood by its friends throughout the most difficult of times, now condemn, in effect, these small Asian nations totally dependent on us? Um, a member speaking for Ford then asked one of the senators further, um, will you, were you actually demanding that the government in Cambodia under Lan Nol should surrender to the Khmer Rouge? And the answer was, yes, that's what we want. We want them to surrender to the Khmer Rouge under controlled circumstances to minimize the loss of life. So they cut off all funding for Cambodia and South Vietnam. All funding, zero, nothing. The Americans no longer have troops there. They airlift out their last personnel from Cambodia literally, I think, seven days before the Khmer Rouge entered Phnom Penh, emptying it of all humans. Anyway, there's more. The U.S. offered, this is interesting, the U.S. offered when it was airlifting out its own people, the famous helicopters who came to rescue the last stranded Americans, they offered in April 1975 to airlift out the Cambodian government and most of its ministers because they knew that they would, of course, be brutalized, killed, tortured, etc. by the Khmer Rouge. To their everlasting shame, nearly every member of the Cambodian government refused to leave. Interestingly, because one of them later wrote a letter to Kissinger, Kissinger who was by this time the National Security Advisor, a handwritten letter in elegant French, because French was of course the second language of the government. And he writes to Henry Kissinger. This is a former uh, Prime Minister of Cambodia named Sirik Matak. He writes, Dear Excellency, I thank you very sincerely for your letter and for your offer to transport me towards freedom. I cannot, alas, leave in such a cowardly fashion. As for you, and in particular for your great country, the United States of America, I never believed for a moment that you would have this sentiment of abandoning a people which has chosen liberty. You have refused us your protection, and we can do nothing about it. Now you leave, and my wish is that you and your country will find happiness under this sky, but mark it well that if I shall die here on this spot, in my country that I love, it is no matter, because we are all born and must die. I have only committed the mistake of believing in you. Ooh. Please accept, Excellency, my faithful and friendly sentiments, etc., etc. Uh, the Khmer Rouge came into town several days later, shot him in the stomach, and left him to die. It took him three days. Oof. Not a happy moment in American history. 1975. So who to blame? Well, I don't know. I mean, here's the thing. It's easy to be 
as we like to call it, a Monday morning quarterback. This is a football metaphor, American football, right? To second guess after the fact. Maybe we shouldn't have been there in the first place. That's definitely a good argument to make. However, once you're there, then there are different arguments in play. The war was not popular among many people. It was probably not going well. The cause was muddled and so on. But at the very end, I think the very least the Americans could have done was offered air support and financial support for anyone willing to stand up for civilization. In the end, of course, there was a mass evacuation. The Vietnamese were lucky enough to live along a coastline where they could jump into boats and flee from, of course, the murderous rage of the North Vietnamese communists. Number I've heard usually about 200,000 or so Vietnamese boat people left. Um, in Cambodia, they weren't so lucky. In Cambodia, most of them, of course, were left to die. There were other peoples in you know, kind of Thailand, Laos, these other places in the hills, like the Hmong you know, from the Clint Eastwood movie. And many of them did end up in America, thus, I suppose, enriching our cuisine, <laughs> as some Americans like to think about things. There's always a small silver lining, I guess. But yeah, in the end, I guess it's, you could make it into a morality play. But in some ways, it's also quite simple. I mean, it is a failure of leadership. It's a failure of authority, a failure to determine what America's foreign policy actually was. And in the end, unfortunately, it discredited, I think, a whole ruling establishment, a whole kind of set of beliefs, and you know, plunged America into this sort of cultural despair, which to some extent has never really lifted. Uh, the split between Nixon's so-called silent majority, that is, of the patriotic Americans who, you know, fight our wars and work in the factories, whatever rhetoric you want to give it, and the Americans who are skeptical about all of this and think the wars aren't worth winning and don't like the military and think they're a bunch of child molesters. Um, it's ugly, you know, and it's very sad. It's not something that's really happy for me as an American to talk about. And whether you draw lessons from it or not, it's something you should know about because it's a big part of 20th century history. Um, the effects we're going to look at next week, uh, first in the kind of realm of politics and culture and then also economics because that's important too, the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. A lot of it has to do with Vietnam and a lot of it also has to do with Richard Nixon. So anyway, I, I want to give Nixon the last word if that's okay. <laughs> so that's what he actually said. It's from a movie, of course. Okay. Uh, it's an Oliver Stone movie about Nixon. So Nixon and Kissinger, humiliated by Watergate, he's about to resign. He's about to go before the nation and resign. Now he goes into this sort of hall in the White House where they have the pictures of the busts of all the presidents. Now Kissinger tells him, oh, such a tragedy for our brilliant policy to be undone by third-rate burglary. Anyway, that was Kissinger. But Nixon is thinking you know, more grandiosely. He's thinking about Kennedy, like he always was. He finally goes up to Kennedy. <laughs> he looks at his picture, this young, smiling, handsome, sexy, charming Kennedy. And he looks at him and he says, when they look at you, that meaning you know, the American people, when they look at you, they see what they want to be. When they look at me, they see what they are. <laughs> Last word to Richard Nixon. Okay, well, anyway, that's enough for today. Um, we're going to look at the, the kind of socio-political economic fallout next week, and we will do the quiz next Friday.